Hello all, welcome to the BSS e-content page. In today's topic, we'll be taking the topic of the problem and the hypothesis. So let us see in today's module, which are the main topics that we will be covering. Well, we will be covering the meaning and characteristics of a problem, which are the different ways in which a problem can be manifested or produced in a research, what are the different types of problem statements that we come across in a research? What are the different types and the characteristics of a very good hypothesis? And the different varieties or types of hypothesis that we find in a scientific research. Well, hello all. My name is Sujike Sunny. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Psychology from the Bhopal School of Social Sciences. Starting from our first question, what is a problem? Well. As our definition goes, a problem statement can be defined as an interrogative testable statement, all right, which explains relationship between two or more variables. Now, when I have to explain to you what does this underlying statement says, a problem statement is going to be something which in, about which we can conduct an investigation. It is going to be in the form of a question. It is interrogative. And why do we want to interrogate? Because it is something that we can test upon and we are looking for an answer. Suppose from the field of psychology, I wish to have an inquiry upon whether there is a difference between the IQ of males or females. Is there any kind of correlation between the creativity and intelligence? Well, if you notice, these are some interrogative questions and well, these questions can be tested. And for sure, I'm asking these questions because I need their answers too. Now, Moving on, as I told you, as we have already defined that what the definition of problem is, it is a question to which you are looking an answer for. But what are the characteristics of formulating a good problematic statement? I can be saying any kind of problem questions. Who are you? Where are you? But well, they don't serve my purpose in a research. So there are a few points that I need to keep in mind when I'm formulating a good problematic statement. Not a good problematic statement, but a statement for a good problem. Well, here are the few characteristics. First one of them is, well, your research question problem must be clear. Clear in terms of its meaning, clear in terms of its articulation, clear in terms of the words that you write and how you write it, how you phrase it. Suppose I say, I wish to test the IQ of males, but why? With whom? When? And which males? The Indian males? the Bhopali males or which males am I talking about? Am I talking about the adult males? Am I talking about the adolescent males? Well, the statement is quite vague in nature. So there is no clarity. What kind of research am I aiming for? So in order to ensure that my problem statement should be clear in terms of its meaning, it should be clear in terms of its articulation, it, uh, it should be clear in terms of how we write it. Coming to the second characteristic, as I was saying earlier also, a good research problem should be specific. If you take a general statement, if you wish to measure the creativity ability of adolescent boys or adolescent girls, that's a very good question. But of which class or which area or which city or which school or of which community? Now there is no specificity mentioned in it. So any kind of research problem that you formulate, ensure that there is as much minute specificity you can introduce, introduce it. Third, well, a good research question should be something to which you can have an answer. Though we say that for all locks, there are good keys, there are always keys to it. For every problem, there is a solution. However, aiming at our resources, our time, we must always have those problems to which we can get an answer to. Suppose if I ask a question, does God exist? Now that's a good question, but can I prove it? Do I have the means to prove it? So in order to have a good research problem upon which you can actually conduct your research, ensure that it is an answerable problem. Moving on, the fourth factor that we need to ensure is a good research problem variables. The factors that you wish to measure or conduct research on, they should have a connection between them. Your research study should be such that you can actually formulate a connection between them. It can be an insignificant connection, it can be a significant connection, but there must exist one. Suppose if I wish to study 
the nature of creativity and intelligence between each other. Well, there is a connection, I'm assuming, and I must prove so. But what is the connection between my food diet and God? Well, you, you can clearly imagine that I might not be able to connect it. Well, at, at this moment, I'm not able to connect it. The fifth point, a good research question is substantively relevant. In today's time, your research should be relevant to me. It should not be a topic which is obsolete in nature. This topic, this problem statement should something be actually applicable to the people, applicable to the population and applicable to the present situation. Well, now we have so far dealt with how do we define a problem? What are the good features of a problem statement? The third factor that I need to look upon is, well, how do I create a problem? Though in common times we don't need to, but in the field of research, there is a lot of rich literature study that we need to do. There are three ways via which you can actually formulate a problem statement for yourself. The first one is a noticeable difference. What does this noticeable difference refer to? Suppose there are so many studies that have been conducted along the different time periods. However, in spite of these studies, there is some part of information which is missing. For example, the field of psychology, I wish to know that which is the best therapeutic technique. All right. Now we have many studies being conducted on this, but so far we have not come across any kind of good answer which says that XYZ is the best therapeutic technique for this kind of mental illness or ABC is the best therapeutic technique for a certain community. So that means there are certain gaps and that means it gives us room to formulate a problem and conduct a research on it. The second factor, contradictory results. Suppose 10 people have conducted a result, a study as such, and 10 of them have actually got 10 different results. So which one to believe in? That in itself poses a very important question. Suppose, again, I go back to my field itself. I say learning can take place from reinforcement. Whereas Albert Bandura comes in and tells me, no, learning not only takes place with reinforcement, it can happen with vicarious learning also. Well, Pavlov jumps in and says it can happen via association also. So which one do I actually consider to be the best one? Learning takes place how? So I do realize that there are three individuals, three of them are giving me different answers and I must come to know what facilitates learning. So once again, I have another situation from which I can formulate my problem. The third situation are isolated facts. Well, isolated facts, I have many research studies wherein we can say creativity is actually important in the field of intelligence, right? But how do I prove it? which is one connecting factor to it. Now that can become an example for me when I wish to connect different strings of variables together and piece one particular piece of information. In that situation as well, I have a problem to be formulated. All right, the next topic for us is types of problems. As you can see on the screen, we have solvable problems and then we have unsolvable problems. As the terminology goes, it's very simple to explain. A solvable problem is something which you can conduct research upon. You can find variables attached to it. It is economical to you and you can find answers. All right. Like we wanted to conduct research whether a vaccination can be built for COVID or not. Well, that was a solvable problem. However long it took us to find one vaccination. All right. Whereas an unsolvable problem. As I asked you in the early phase of our lecture, does God exist? Well, the data I have in my hand is on the basis of faith. In faith, people can stand up and say that we have testimonies to share and that yes, God exists. But how do I uh, prove his presence in the lab? How do I bring in the empirical data? I lack information over there. So a solvable data or a solvable problem would be one to which I can have a structured problem, a structured data, and I can actually collect empirical information for it. Whereas, for unsolvable problem, my question itself will be what? Unstructured. It will be vague. It will be difficult for me to collect. I emphasize the empirical data. You need to believe that research is actually scientific. And the more scientific we are in terms of collecting our data, the more uh, efficiently we'll, we'll be able to generalize it. Henceforth, in unsolvable problems, we get to know 
there are some questions that are left better unanswered. Now coming to the second phase of our lecture. In the first part, we dealt with the definition, the types, and how we can formulate different types of problem, problem statements. In this session, in this mode, we'll actually be covering the topic of hypothesis. See, once you have started with problem, the next thing that you move on to is hypothesis. What do we mean by hypothesis? As the definition first states, McGuigan tells us that it is a testable solution of a possible relationship between the variables that we wish to conduct research upon. What do I mean by that? Well, it is a prediction. Before I conduct my research, before I conduct my uh, investigation, let's just say I have a prediction that after conducting this research, I may come to this solution. So this is a suggestible solution and I am making a prediction beforehand. My whole purpose of research would be to either prove this uh, testable solution or to disapprove it. My second definition tells me it's a conjectural statement. Conjectural statement again refers to something that I can formulate in spite of not having all the correct facts in my hand. So I'm assuming and on the basis of those assumptions, I give a direction to my research and that actual direction will help me whether my conjectured statement is actually true for the variables that I'm including in my research or not. Every time that when we write a hypothesis, we always mention it in the form of a declarative statement. We declare it out. Whether we are true or not, that only the end of the research will tell us. See, I told you in problem, when we mention it, we write it in the form of interrogation. It's a question. So if there is a question, hypothesis is a testable solution. And well, solution cannot be in the form of question. Henceforth, we always ensure that we mention it in the form of a declarative statement. Also, what are the good characteristics characteristics of a good hypothesis. What are the good features of a good hypothesis? Well, they're quite similar in line with how a good problem statement should be. A hypothesis should be conceptually clear. Suppose if you are formulating a hypothesis, once again, there should not be any kind of ambiguity. You are giving a solution, but that solution must sound possible. It must sound true to a theory or it must sound true to the evidences that you're going to collect. The hypothesis must be testable. See, we are again and again repeating. We can have n number of questions. Our little children have n number of questions. But those questions and those solutions only become meaningful if I can test them. Third factor, well, hypothesis should be economical and parsimonious. I can have n number of ideas. I can be the next Archimedes. And that's a very good thing. Sky is the limit. But your solution sh should always be actually friendly to your pocket. All right, you wish to conduct many researches, that's a very good thing. But your research should always be something that you can actually afford. Grants can come in in the form of various resources. However, only take up those hypotheses which are affordable for you. Fourth, well, a hypothesis related to the existing body of theory and fact. If you are going to formulate a solution which you need to test upon, ensure that you know you have a framework, a foundation, a theoretical foundation to base it upon. It makes your work easy. At the same time, it actually grabs eyeballs of others as well. The last one, hypothesis should be general in scope. See, the whole point of conducting a research is when you can actually uh, apply that research whatever conclusion that comes out of it when you can apply it to the general population. So look for a possible solution which is quite general, which can be applicable to all and if not applicable to all, at least can be relevant to the present time. Now we are going to talk about the different types of hypothesis that we have. The first one that I'm going to talk about is the universal hypothesis. Well, these are those statements or those testable solutions which can be applied to all the population across the whole world. Well, the, the increase of light increases reading ability or when I say Newton's law, it was applicable across all the backgrounds, across all the countries. Newton's law is applicable in UK, applicable in India, applicable in USA as well. The second one that I'm going to talk about is existential hypothesis. What we refer by it is, see, whichever relationship is stated through this statement, we mean to say that it at least exists in one case. For example, if I say 
there can be one schizophrenic case in which there might not be any sign of hallucination or delusion. So I am stating that there is a relationship which might exist for at least a particular case. Moving on, the next hypothesis that we have in front of us is the causal hypothesis. As the name goes, this causal hypothesis will tell me about the cause as well as the effect between the mentioned variables, the why of my behavior. All right. The next one, the descriptive hypothesis will tell me certain features about a certain behavior. It will also tell me when that behavior can occur. So it is actually describing me something much more. The other terminologies that we use for hypothesis are simple hypothesis. As the name goes, only one or two dependent or independent variables are included in it. For example, is there any correlation between creativity and intelligence? I've only used two variables in it. A complex hypothesis? Well, it is a little complicated. Why? Because it is including two dependent variables or more than two dependent variables and more than two independent variables. What is the effect of drug intake and alcohol intake on your nutrition, your mental health and your family life? So I'm including more than two dependent as well as independent variables. The third we move on to is the research hypothesis. Well, this is a hypothesis we, we formulate on the basis of a theory, on a theoretical framework. Suppose I'm conducting a research from the psychoanalytic field. So I state a statement out of the theory itself. So my whole goal would be whatever statement I am stating over here, I prove it. Not deliberately, but my aim would be such. The fourth one is null hypothesis. When in most psychological researches, in fact, in all the researches, what is the significance of null hypothesis is, which says that whichever two or three variables we have included, there is as such no significant relationship between them. That's when we state the null hypothesis. We wish to say that in case if there is any kind of differential data that we are getting, it's because of the sampling error or some error that happened on its own. The last one that we have with us for today's session is the statistical hypothesis. Well, this hypothesis is actually a very simple statement. Any hypothesis that you can formulate and verify in the form of statistical method, well, that will come under your statistical hypothesis. Thank you for listening to me so far. For more such information, stay tuned to this page. Thank you.